Hey everyone, John Reed here, astronomer and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series, including 110 Things to See with a Telescope, A Kid's Guide to the Night Sky, and 50 Things to See with a Telescope for Kids. This video is going to be a bit longer than usual. I'm sure YouTube will break this video down into chapters, so feel free to skip around. Now every November, I try to do a holiday video where I see what's out there in the telescope world, and I try to answer this question. I'm a beginner, and my budget is X, what telescope should I buy? In this video, I'm going to start with budgets of around $100 and work up from there. We'll look at telescopes for kids, for adults, and even those with disabilities. And this year, this video is sponsored by All Star Telescope. And even though this video is sponsored, I'll tell you why this won't affect my selections. If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you'll know that I have five rules and a few red flags that I use when recommending a beginner telescope. The second reason sponsorship doesn't affect my choices is that I've noticed that pretty much every telescope retailer, from All Star Telescope to High Point Scientific to B&H Photo, and to some extent even Amazon, all seem to have the same prices. I'm not sure why that is, but even when telescopes go on sale, these retailers tend to discount their prices by the same amount. That said, why should you buy a telescope from a telescope store like All Star Telescope? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that unlike Amazon or B&H Photo, designated telescope shops offer support from telescope experts. If you can't figure out how to use your new telescope, reach out to them and they'll help. You won't get this level of support from non-telescope retailers like Amazon. On a side note, All Star Telescope does not seem to carry the brand SV Boney. These are telescopes carried by Amazon and I've heard lots of things about them. However, SV Boney sent me a telescope and there was an issue with the optics and I'm still waiting on a replacement. If you have any SV Boney gear that you like, leave a note in the comments and let us know. The second reason to buy from retailers like All Star Telescope is that All Star carries the correct accessories to go with your telescope. For example, if you want to take photos with your new apochromatic telescope, then you'll need the appropriate field flattener or focal reducer. Matching a telescope and its accessories is far easier to do on a website like All Star Telescopes and far less frustrating when you have support provided by their staff. If you're watching this video, you know that choosing a telescope has become an incredibly complicated task. For one, there's a lot of junk telescopes out there with 5 star reviews. But more specifically, choosing a first telescope or purchasing a telescope as a gift is heavily determined by the following questions and you might not know all the answers. Number one, who is doing the observing? Is this really for your six year old or is this really for you? Number two, what are you planning to observe? There is a huge difference between a telescope that can see the moon, which even a junk telescope can do, and one that can also observe deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula. Number three, where are you observing from? There are different considerations depending on whether you're observing from the city or from dark skies. Number four, do you plan to take photos? People should know that stargazing and astrophotography are very different hobbies. There are some cases where the gear might overlap, but for most budgets, they don't. Speaking of budgets, what is your budget? This is by far the biggest determinant of what you'll be able to see because for the most part, you get what you pay for. Another question that I get asked about from time to time is what telescope to get if the intended user has a disability that would prevent them from carrying a large telescope or if they need to be sitting down or observing from a wheelchair. And what country you live in can also vastly affect what telescopes are available. All Star Telescope does claim to be able to ship worldwide, but I get it that import taxes and tariffs often make telescopes much more expensive outside of North America. All right, only after you've answered these questions can you start to think about the type of telescope you should consider. And don't be surprised if the telescope you want doesn't exist. Sometimes when answering comments on my YouTube channel, I feel like a broken record. Someone will ask me for a beginner telescope that provides close-up views of Saturn, but then they also want to take high-definition images of galaxies and nebula with their DSLR, and they only have a budget of $300. Well, I'm sorry, but such a telescope simply doesn't exist at that price range. You're basically describing my observatory, which I'm afraid to say costs slightly more than $300. I think people also have a skewed idea about what is fun. A lot of people want to take pictures of what they see through the eyepiece with their phones. The idea being, of course, that they'd like to share these images on social media. But here's the thing, trying to take good photos with your phone 
through a $300 telescope simply isn't fun. It's actually quite frustrating. There's a lot to digest when it comes to telescopes, especially since there are so many types of telescopes, which requires an entirely separate video altogether. If you need a refresher on the different types of telescopes, I have a video called How to Use Any Telescope. I'll post a link in the description. In terms of what type of telescope is best for you, I figured I'd break this down in a flowchart. Keep in mind, this is my personal opinion as someone who has three kids and owns literally every type of telescope and stargazes on every clear night. Okay, so here's the flowchart that explains the calculus that every astronomer must do when they get the question, what telescope should I buy? Okay, so this chart breaks down the who is getting the telescope, a young child, a child or family, teen or adult, or someone that's physically challenged. What are they looking at? Are they looking at the moon and planets? Or are they looking at deep sky objects like galaxies and nebula? Where are they observing from? For the moon and planets, doesn't matter. They're gonna look the same from downtown in the city or in the country. But for deep sky objects, it makes a big difference. And then we need to look at what hobby are we talking about here? Are we talking about just stargazing? Or are we talking about astrophotography? As we follow this chart down, now we can start looking at the budgets. Here we have telescopes ranging in price from $100 up to even $7,000. So as we go into the next section where I'm choosing specific telescopes, this is the chart that I'm using to fit those telescopes into every budget and for every purpose. I'll post a link in the description where you can download this chart on your own and look at it in more detail. Let's walk through my specific recommendations for telescopes at every budget. Starting with telescopes for very young kids who you think might be interested in only the moon and maybe Jupiter, and if your budget is less than $100, we're limited here to just the Celestron first scope. Now for some reason, they got rid of the finder. You must buy that separately. The next step up from the Celestron first scope would be the Skywatcher Heritage series, such as the Skywatcher Heritage 130 or the Skywatcher Heritage 150. You may also be able to find an Orion Skyscanner kicking around, but Orion went out of business last year, which is a shame because that telescope, along with the Z100, which is also hard to find, were great telescopes for small kids. On a side note, please do not ask me in the comments about those tiny refractors you see on Amazon. Those are clearly not designed for looking at space at all. If the telescope is directly fixed to a tripod, then it's designed for looking at bird feeders, not really for looking at space. Moving over to telescopes for kids in general, I'm picking telescopes here that my eight and nine year olds have had success with. So sometimes you might see an 80 millimeter or 90 millimeter refractor with a long focal length. It might be at a reasonable price and you wonder if it's any good. Now I've listed long tube, high focal length refractors only under the moon and planet section of my flowchart. An example of this is the Astromaster 90AZ. The reason for the long tubes is to increase the focal length, which reduces chromatic aberration or CA. Chromatic aberration is particularly noticeable on the moon and planets in shorter refractors. I've not found chromatic aberration to be noticeable at all on deep sky objects with any telescope. If you only want to get a good view of the moon without chromatic aberration and not spend a lot of money, then a long tube refractor like the Astromaster 90AZ is fine. But if you want to see deep sky objects, I think it's better to put your money toward higher aperture. For the moon and planets, we're in the realm of the Max Sutov telescope here. One example is the Skywatcher SkyMax 102. For some reason, with Mac telescopes, you often need to provide your own mount. If you're just looking for something light and inexpensive, the Twilight Nano mount would probably work just fine. I have this mount and I use it from time to time, but you may wish to upgrade to something more robust and more precise, like the Skywatcher AZ-5. We've already talked about the tabletop Dubsonians, like the Skywatcher Heritage series. As an alternative to these, I really like the 102 refractors. There are a lot of these on the market by nearly every manufacturer. And I know this video is sponsored by All Star Telescope. That said, my kids really like these 102 millimeter refractors from Costco. They don't seem to advertise these online, but sometimes they drop in price below $200 in store. Now I've tested these scopes extensively and I found that subjectively they outperformed the 130 millimeter Newtonians, at least in terms of their optics. As an example of a higher quality 102 millimeter refractor, that would be the Star Travel 102, which I've called the Forever Telescope in a previous video. 
It has a two inch focuser, which means it can support two inch diagonals and two inch eyepieces. Out of the box, it's great for landscape observations. For looking at space, it helps to purchase a 90 degree diagonal. There's also the Celestron StarSense 102 DX. I really like StarSense. It makes it incredibly easy to find things in space. StarSense uses your phone to help you find targets telling you which way to push your telescope. It's a lot of fun and makes finding deep sky objects pretty easy. We should take a moment here to talk about eyepieces. Many of these telescopes do not come with high quality eyepieces. Typically the advice here is to upgrade the eyepieces that came with the telescope to higher quality eyepieces that share the same focal length. For example, this Skywatcher Star Travel comes with a 25 millimeter eyepiece and a 10 millimeter eyepiece. For your first upgrade, you might want to upgrade the 10 millimeter eyepiece to a high quality eyepiece like the Bader Hyperion 10 millimeter eyepiece. This would give you a much larger field of view with better eye relief and higher contrast due to the quality of the optics. If you just want higher magnifications, a generic 2x Barlow may be all you need, but a zoom eyepiece would give you much better control. There are several zoom eyepieces on the market and like telescopes, you get what you pay for with those in the $100 range being good and those in the $300 range being great. Back to telescopes. If you've got a budget of over $400, at this point, it's time to start considering Dobsonian style telescopes if you're planning on sticking with visual astronomy. Dobsonians offer by far the best value in telescopes for visual observing. The higher apertures grant access to higher magnifications and collect enough light to see extremely faint stars, giving you immersive views through the eyepiece. Now, besides taking images of the moon with your phone, Dobsonians are not designed for astrophotography. If you do want to take photos of the moon, I recommend using a Celestron Next YZ to hold the phone in place. That will save you a lot of stress. If you've got a budget of $500 and you want to attach a camera to your telescope, then we should now start talking about the sea star instead. Trying to capture deep sky objects with a Dobsonian is not much fun, whereas the Sea Star can get you images that just a few years ago would have cost several thousands of dollars in camera gear. And no, the images are not pre stored on the hard drive, downloaded from the internet, or generated with AI. The Sea Star is simply a fancy camera that tracks the sky and stacks multiple images together. This reduces the noise and brings out the detail in the objects. Moving on to telescopes for adults and teenagers. If you love observing the moon, a long tube refractor, like the Explorer Scientific First Light 102, the 1000 millimeter version, or a Maksutov like the Skywatcher SkyMax will work just fine. And if your budget is around $800, you might even consider the Explorer Scientific First Light 102 millimeter doublet refractor on the twilight mount. This one has a larger focuser and a larger diagonal for two inch eyepieces. I have this scope and it's beautiful. Even at this point and you're on a budget and you want to take photos of the moon and maybe the planets, your best bet is still to get a Celestron Next YZ. This is the only cell phone adapter I found to actually work, without stress that is. And if you want to take epic photos of the planets, you might consider a designated planetary imaging camera. These cameras take the place of the eyepiece and connect to a PC or your phone with the help of an ASI Air. You use what's called lucky imaging to stack the images, even if you're tracking by hand. One example of a planetary camera is the ZWO ASI 715MC. You can check a website called Astrobin to see images taken with this camera and any other astronomy cameras. Note that when imaging planets, the biggest determinant of quality of your image will be the condition of your sky and the aperture of the telescope. If you're interested in great views of the moon and planets and your budget is nearing $1,000 at this point, you're going to want to start looking at SCT style telescopes like the Celestron Nexstar series, starting with the Nexstar 5SE and going with the biggest aperture within your budget. Now, if your budget is only around $100 and you want to observe deep sky objects, the best telescope is no telescope. You're far better off investing in a good pair of binoculars. You can see a lot with a basic pair of 7x50s. Astronomy binoculars like Celestron SkyMaster series can also be found for around $100, but I found it helps to use these with a tripod. There are tripods with counterweights, but I found that a nice camera tripod or monopod works just fine. You may need to get an adapter to fit your binoculars to a tripod, and these cost between $20 and $30. 
And if your budget is only around $200, again, you might consider one of the Costco 102 millimeter refractors on AZ mounts, if they carry them this year. You might also consider, just like for kids, the Skywatcher Heritage. If you're planning to observe deep sky objects on a budget of less than $500, some options include Newtonians like the Skywatcher Virtuoso GTI 150P or higher quality refractors like the Star Travel 102 or StarSense 102DX. If you have dark skies and want a high quality portable refractor that might become part of a future astrophotography rig, you can even begin to look at scopes like the Skywatcher EvoStar 72ED, Apple Refractor, or telescopes in the Evolux series. Note that these scopes would not come with a mount and you need to buy the diagonal, eyepiece, and finder separately. Above $500 for purely visual observing, you really wanna start looking at Dobsonian telescopes, starting with the classic eight inch Dobsonian or the flex tube version, which can more easily fit into a car. Basically, if you're just into visual observing, max out your budget on aperture and a good eyepiece. There are Dobsonians on literally every budget from $1,000 to $2,000 to $3,000 to $5,000 to $10,000 and even $100,000 and so on. For a very portable telescope, both for the planets and deep sky objects, there's the Celestron StarSense DX5. And if your budget is a little higher, the next star evolution series would be a great choice as well. If you want to take photos of galaxies and nebula and your budget is less than $500, a DSLR on a tripod is really your only option. At $500, again, you should consider the C-Star. And if your budget is $1,000 and you want to take epic wide field images, a star tracker like the Skywatcher Star Adventurer or Star Adventurer GTI and a DSLR is all you need. At $2,000, some premium smart telescopes like the Unistellar Odyssey become options as well. The Odyssey can do both planetary and deep sky photography. With a budget of $3,000 and higher, you can begin to put together your first deep sky imaging rig. Now, if I were starting over on this budget, here's what I'd get. I'd start with a Star Adventure GTI for the mount. Now for the telescope, I might start with an Ascar 65 PHQ quintuplet refractor astrograph. This telescope does not require a field flattener. I'd pair this with the ZWO ASI 533MC Pro, a great entry-level cooled astronomy camera known for its low noise sensor. You'll also need a guiding system. The most popular system for guiding is comprised of a ZWO ASI 120mm mini monochrome camera and a small guide scope such as the ZWO 30mm f4 mini. To control everything, I'd use an ASI Air Mini. These work on both iPhone and Android devices, and they're extremely easy to use. Most of the time, I use the live stacking feature and simply process the images on my phone, no computer required. Now I power my small astrophotography rigs with the Celestron Power Tank Lithium. Other accessories include light pollution filters or narrow band nebula filters like the Optolong L-Extreme dual band narrow band filter, dew heaters, and electronic focusers. For those with disabilities, refractors are the easiest telescope to use while sitting down. Though below $200, your best bet is still probably binoculars. After that, basically you're gonna be looking for the highest quality refractor in your budget. One scope that I've found to be really enjoyed by people with disabilities is the Skywatcher Star Travel 102 AZ GTE. This is a 102 millimeter refractor on a go-to mount controlled by your phone. Now with that same mount, the AZ GTE, the largest scope that could work with this is the Skywatcher SkyMax 127 Maxutov, which would offer incredible views of the moon, planets, and deep sky objects. And for deep sky astrophotography here, if your budget is less than $500, a DSLR on a tripod is still probably your best bet. Over $500, again, you have the C-Star. And if your budget is higher and you can't lug around a designated astrophotography rig, a premium smart telescope like the Unistellar Odyssey might be an option as well. Well, we sure covered a lot here. I hope you enjoyed this video on telescopes for every budget. Thanks again to All Star Telescope for sponsoring this video. Subscribe to Learn to Stargaze to take your stargazing experience to the next level. If you want to download my astronomy flowchart or sign up for my mailing list, visit learntostargaze.com. Add one of my books to your holiday shopping list and remember, the future is looking up.